Welcome to the Play Inspire Unite podcast. I'm your host, Ben Rycroft. In our last podcast before the Ontario Soccer Summit, February 21st to 23rd at Redeemer University, we're joined by one of our keynote speakers today, Kelly Mermitz, the former head of Tennis Canada and the former head of Participation. She's got a fantastic array of stories about leadership, sport, and everything in between. She's going to give us some real insight into her development initiatives, as well as fitness in Canada at this time. If you haven't got your tickets already, head over to OntarioSoccer.net right now, get them, and come back and join us for the podcast with Kelly Mermitz. Kelly, thanks very much for joining us. My absolute pleasure. This is going to be great. Uh, let's begin by discussing your time of participation. It had been shut down in 2001 and was revived under your leadership. Anybody who grew up in the 80s knew Body Break by heart, but more than that, participation sparked a discussion around the, the state of physical education in Canada and a discussion that's still relevant today. I wonder if you can give us a take on where things are at now in Canada, what the challenges are for the physical fitness in modern society today. I'm delighted to tell you this fact. I'll just give you some background. So I know basically how old you are that you remember Hal and Joanne. If you're my age, you would remember the Canada Fitness Awards, which is not accurately so, but attributed to participation. So I remember in school, I was always striving to get the award of excellence. And I, and I did, by the way. <laughs> So, um, participation, I have an MBA, but I also went back to do a Master of Social Work because I wanted to change the world. And let me give you some of the stats because participation is changing the world. You will be horrified when you hear some of these stats. Only 39% of kids and teens get one hour of physical activity a day. Levels of physical activity decrease by 7% per year among 10 to 19 year olds. Boys are twice as likely as girls to meet physical activity guidelines. And we know that girls uh, typically in their teens start to drop out of sport. They don't like being sweaty. Uh, more than half of kids and teens exceed the two hour recommendation for screen time. And then the last one will just say physical inactivity is the fourth leading risk factor for global, global mortality. And annual cost of physical inactivity in Canada is $6.8 billion in healthcare costs. So if you want to go change the world, that would be reversing those trends and, and participation had and has the capacity to do that. So I loved participation and I still love participation. So I wonder if we can dive into those trends just a little bit. It's something that we're looking into here, player recruitment and retention. We take that very seriously and obviously the trend is across all sports at this point. I mean, aside from the, the known factors, what are some of the things that you feel are contributing to that decline in physical activity today? I mean, the number one issue is screen time, for sure. Um, and, and the other issues at play, I think, are, you know, it's, I don't like to, to blame parents, but I think parents are really, really busy today. We have both, both parents, we're both working, and we don't have the time to drive our kids to sport after school like my mother did when I was a kid. I mean, I know it's not like in the good old days, but my mom stayed at home with us and drove us to every sport you could imagine after school, so we played sport. Um, also, I think that's what's happening is parents sometimes get home at dinner time, and so after school, when you would normally think of kids being outdoors and playing until the street lights come on in the olden days, um, kids are hanging out with their screens and they're not being supervised, so they're reading, you know, reading whatever, talking back and forth with their friends on screens. Screens really are um, the number one factor to Canadian physical inactivity stats today. That's really interesting, and the, the stuff about scheduling is stuff we've seen as well. That parents today definitely want to see it fit into their schedule, as opposed to make it fit into their schedule. So that's certainly a factor as well. Yeah, and, and that's just the reality, right? I mean, poor parents. We're trying as we're trying to do the best that we can possibly do, of course. Right. Um, but it's a, the world is different today than it was certainly thirty years ago. So you were the CEO of Tennis Canada from 2014 to 2017. And I think it's fair to say that some of the success that tennis is now seeing in Canada is experienced in part due to your leadership during that time. Take us through that time uh, from taking over in 2014. What are some of the challenges that are in front of you at that time? I just would like to start with humbly. Um, the success today is certainly not uh, because of me, but um, thank you. That's very nice after um, you. You know, when I arrived at Tennis Canada, the board said, put your hand on that tiller, the ship's moving in the right direction, and don't change direction. 
And so I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I mean, I, you know, I want to kind of put my mark on this and make sure that we can make the organization as great as it can be. And so for the most part, the external strategy was actually very sound. So I did have my hand on the tiller and we continued to move in the same direction externally. Internally, I would say the organization was not optimal. So when I arrived, I met with all 100 to 150 employees one-on-one, -on -one, every single employee in our organization right across the country, and just said, hey, where do you land on an org chart? And most people didn't know who their, their manager was. Uh, we didn't have a performance management system in place. And so I was doing all of the very unglamorous things um, in my first year, which is really all the internal things. So setting up a financial reporting system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we don't talk a lot about that as leaders in sport. Uh, we really look externally and look to see on the podium or on the global stage. Um, but internally, if we don't have the internal mechanism in place, we're not poised for growth or future success. So I really did the unglamorous uh, work in my first year. As I said, the, uh, the development system was really very sound. And so then I started to look externally uh, and internationally to say, how do we make sure that Tennis Canada is on the world stage? Uh, whether that's from uh, making sure the best players come to our tournaments, or making sure that we're connected with the best coaches, nutritionists, physiotherapists, therapists in the world for our athletes. And um, I would tell you, I was almost always the only woman at most of those ten at the table where we were talking about international tennis. I was usually the only woman, and I do think that's an issue. Certainly with tennis, that's a sport that I know is male dominated, and um, at the business level. The leadership business level, uh, it is mostly men, and, and, and I was and continue today to be the only woman who runs a tennis federation in the world, I believe. Um, and I believe at the time I was the only woman who um, was responsible for a Masters 1000 level uh, ATP tournament. So um, I kept my hand on the tiller for our development system, I overhauled us internally, and I took quite a position on the international stage as it related to the governance of the sport. How did that reflect on the sort of the female leadership side of things, taking that, uh, that, that platform or podium in, in international standards and bringing it back to Canada? Were people taking notice at that time of uh, the stature that you were holding in the international community? Yes, absolutely. So I think when I first arrived at some of these meetings, the men, they liked me, but I'm pretty tough, and so they weren't quite sure what to do with me. Sure. Um, and at the summit, I will tell some of um, some very candid stories um, about uh, the international stage and the role that I played. But I do believe that I started to establish Tennis Canada as a federation and our tournaments uh, on the world stage, and that we were really a force to be reckoned with. Uh, at the same time, so concurrent with that, our our juniors, which now are our, our professional tennis players, were really starting to take the stage all on their own. And that is a direct reflection of the Tennis Canada Tennis Development System, of which I really and truly take no credit. That's the one where I had my hand on the tiller. Um, before my time, uh, Tennis Canada had the wisdom to hire Louis Borfiga as our national coach, a very definitive man from France. I love Louis, I have so much respect for him, and really and truly, he uh, defined and implemented the tennis development system that exists today. Um, certainly, I'd like to say I put my signature on it in terms of tweaks, but it exists today and is really and truly the engine behind our, our incredible success with our athletes. So let's jump into that for a second and talk a little bit about that high performance discussion. Uh, it's become somewhat of a darling here in Canada as it relates to high performance in part for its unique approach to development. For those who aren't familiar, walk us through that development initiative that were instituted and allow some of those successes that we're now seeing on the world stage for Canada. This excites me like that. I actually miss sport right now. I'm retired. Um, so our, our system was basically we worked uh, very hard to have relationships with private coaches across the country. Again, I think that I brought uh, a little bit of a different attitude to that. I, I, I tend to be pretty humble, and so uh, I focus very hard on Tennis Canada, assuming a humble position with private coaches across the country so that they knew that we were working together, that we were a team. 
to uh, really develop young talent. Then what we would do is work with those private coaches to bring the best of the best to our regional training centers. Vancouver, uh, there's somewhat of a regional training center now in Calgary, Toronto, Montreal, and there's somewhat of a regional training center now in Halifax. So the best of the uh, best went to our regional training centers. And then when athletes turned 14, the best of the best in our regional training centers were invited to our national training center in Montreal. And um, as we grew the success of the tournaments, we were able to generate more and more revenue from those tournaments and sponsorship dollars. Those dollars were directly laid into our tennis development system. And so as the dollars increased, we really, really were thinking about who are the best coaches in the world? Who are the best therapists in the world? Who are the best sports psychologists in the world? In the world. And anytime I had a conversation with Louie and his team, it was who is the best in the world? And so now you start to just take that tennis development system that uh, at its core is, is profound, and now you tweak it and develop it, develop it, develop it. And that, I would say, is a very unique advantage that Tennis Canada has in that we have two tournaments that generate millions of dollars. And so we as a tennis federation, as a sport federation, are, are extremely wealthy vis-a-vis -vis other sport federations in the country. Yeah. The only thing I will put my name to, and this is a bit of a cute story, and I hope Louie would agree. Um, uh, so I'm a woman, and I have a different perspective sometimes than the fellas. And uh, even in our organization, I was working extremely hard. I mean, half the people in the world are women. Half the tennis players in the world are women. And so I worked very hard to find the best of the best, and I believe that the best of the best in our organization can be women, whether they're coaches or whatever they're, whatever role they're playing in Tennis Canada. So I worked very hard to uh, increase uh, the sort of parity between women and men in our, in our organization. So I would always be at uh, Louis to say, can't you find great female coaches anywhere in the world? And so that was our quest. But he came to me at one point and he said, um, you know, we have a bit of a problem. You know, Bianca Andreescu, she's a, she's a talent, she's fantastic, she's at our Toronto Regional Training Center, and I mean, when she turns 14, which she's just about to turn 14, she would naturally move to our Montreal National Training Center, but her mom is reluctant to let her move to Montreal, and we said, I, I just really don't know what to do. I said, Louie, as a woman, I, I know what to do. We leave her in Toronto, and we said, "But if you, you know, if you change the system, then we start to have cracks in the system." I said, "No, the, the best systems have flexibility and can roll with um, as the world changes. We we can roll with those changes." And so that's my only little, little, little tiny claim to fame is that I uh, convinced Louis that we would leave Bianca to train at our Toronto Regional Training Center and give her the best in the world. Coaches, therapists, etc., 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 and that story's been written. I mean, Bianca is a spectacular young woman, and she is a spectacular tennis player. She makes every single Canadian proud. And um, you know, I, I also love when I listen to her interview. She talks about the important role that Tennis Canada has played in her career. So, I mean, Bianca is one of Felix, Dennis, obviously Neil, Jimmy, Gabby. We have such wonderful young talent today. It's interesting. I want to touch on what you were just mentioning there with the, sort of a decentralized and centralized approach to development. Um, and you mentioned with Louis as well, not wanting to allow cracks creep into the system. When you're working with the provider on the outside, the decentralized portion, how are you putting guardrails in place to ensure that they're following your development philosophies? Do you mean the athletes or our coaches? The coaches. Uh, well, the coaches, again, we are, um, it's really, it's through communication. Uh, that sounds so simplistic, but it is through communication and relationships. I mean, as I said, I'm an MBA, but I'm a master of social work. I think I use my social work degree way more than my MBA every single day in life because all of us are just simply humans. And so we have these incredible private coaches across the country uh, who have done, you know, a lot of wonderful, wonderful work. And um, I feel that Tennis Canada, yes, we definitely need to have guidelines, we definitely need to have standards, but it is in conjunction with the private coaches that we need to 
create and develop those standards and then work with them in terms of implementation of those standards. And um, I don't know that that was exactly the philosophy when I arrived. Um, we also had a little bit of an issue with our provincial tennis associations. And for me, we adopted the exact same approach. It is about communication. It's about relationships. It's about involving all of those stakeholders in the process, as opposed to Tennis Canada coming from on high to dictate to the country how this is going to work. So it, it has to be two-way. It's how I live my life. It's how I run every business I've run. And um, I actually think we made some good progress uh, over my years there. We're just a couple weeks away from Ontario Soccer Summit, February 21st to 23rd at Redeemer University. You're no uh, stranger to summiting. You've climbed uh, Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Rainier as well. Describe for us that feeling when you get to the top and what I assume is months of planning and, of course, the arduous effort to actually climb the mountain. What does it feel like when you get there? Well, it's elation. But it's so interesting to me because um, I love adventure. I like testing myself physically. I like testing myself mentally. And, um, I mean, there's no more um, symbolic way of showing that or demonstrating that than climbing a mountain because you start at the bottom and you have to get to the top. And um, for me, Mount Rainier was the most difficult, even though it's about 13, 14,000 feet and um, uh, Kilimanjaro is 20,000 feet. And, and here's my little Rainier story, and it'll give you some insight into me and hopefully it appeals to some folks that would like to come in here uh, and speak at the, the summit. But, when uh, a friend of mine phoned and he said, Cal, we've got to climb Mount Rainier with Ed Beasters. I said, first of all, where's Mount Rainier and who's Ed Beasters? And Ed Beasters has climbed all of the highest peaks with no oxygen. So he's a very, very, very famous American mountain climber. And so uh, this was months and months in advance. Uh, the climb was in uh, August. And so uh, I think in April, Brandon phoned me and said, oh, I'm not in good enough shape. I can't make it. I never quit anything, ever, so I know I'm climbing Rainier in, in August, and I drove out there by myself, and of course I was the only woman who was, uh, I think, six men and, and three male guides, and I was thinking, whew, this is going to be fantastic, some of the guys might be carrying some of my gear, and I'm in my own bed, and none of that happened, uh, I was with the guys, it was two, two, three of us in one tent, two guys and me in a tent, I carried all of my own gear. And in fact, it was a really difficult climb. So one guy didn't make it. We, we had to actually cocoon him at the side of the, the trail. As we summited, we came back to get him. Another guy broke his leg, and, and Beasters carried him off the mountain. And by the way, passed me while he was carrying uh, him off the mountain. <laughs> um, and uh, the last evening, I, honestly, when I got back, I could barely lift my hands above my head to, to wash my hair because I was so depleted of energy. But we had a celebratory barbecue. And so it was the three guys kind of saying a little something about each one of us. And they got me to last. And Ed Beasters presented me with a, with a little speech. He said, you know, we're like, oh, a girl. We have a girl on the climb. And then we're not going to be able to swear or, I don't know another word for this, but or fart. And um, he said, you made us feel totally comfortable. You did all those things first. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, that's my story, mountain climbing. <laughs> You've got a lot of great stories, and uh, Ontario Soccer Summit attendees are going to be very lucky to hear them in just a few weeks' time. Uh, Kelly, for, before we go, if you can sort of uh, give us your 30-second elevator pitch for anybody who's sort of on the fence about attending Ontario Soccer Summit, what would you say to them to convince them to, to join us in uh, March, uh, February 21st to 23rd at Redeemer University? So it is going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, I've gone back and listened to some of the speeches over the years, and uh, my approach, similar to many others, including John Furlong in the past, is going to be just to tell stories. So I will candidly share my stories uh, about what I've learned in sport over my 13, 14 years, and um, I, I promise no gems of wisdom. But uh, I'm hoping that by telling my stories or by listening to other people's stories, that some of those stories resonate with our audience and that they take some little gem, maybe not wisdom, but some little gem away with them uh, in order to either do their job or their volunteer job or live life in some way that's just a tad bit better. Kelly, thanks, thanks very much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you soon. Can't wait. My absolute pleasure. Thanks, Ben.
Thanks very much to Kelly for joining us. And thank you again for joining us as well. We hope to see you at Ontario Soccer Summit in just a few weeks' time. It's going to be an exciting event. So if you haven't got your tickets, head over to OntarioSoccer.net right now and get them. And before we go, I'll remind you once again to always play, inspire, and unite.